I'm Brandon Amoroso, and this is the D2Z Podcast, building and growing your business from a Gen Z perspective. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to D2Z, a podcast by using the Gen Z mindset to grow your business. I'm Gen Z entrepreneur Brandon Amoroso, founder and president of Retention as a Service Agency Electric. Uh, today, I'm talking with Megan, who's actually the head of agency partnerships over at retention.com. Uh, I think joined about a week or two ago now. Um, and then previously before that was at Signified, which is uh, how I came to first meet her. But um, thank you so much for coming on the show. Really excited to have you. Thanks for having me. I didn't know you'd let millennials on the show. I'm glad I made it on. <laughs> <laughs> we, we made a one-time exception for you. Did it. <laughs> I'm still cool. <laughs> <laughs> if you can use TikTok, then you basically count as Gen Z anyways. And then I don't have a TikTok. Are you going to kick me off? Uh, yeah. I will... Shoot. All right. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll... End of interview. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> I'll make that a question in the intake form. For, okay, uh, good. Make podcast. sure you filter out the riffraff next time. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, um, before we start diving into some of the topics I know we want to cover today, can you give everybody just a sort of quick intro to your to yourself? Yeah, of course. Um, so like you said, I'm the head of agency partnerships uh, here at retention.com. And for those of your listeners that aren't really familiar with the whole partnerships world, um, my role is to really act as a business partner for marketing agencies, dev agencies, consultants, really anyone that advises on behalf of our e-commerce stores. Uh, I make sure those partners are educated and trained on what retention.com does, how it works, um, and make sure that they understand what kind of customers it really works with so that you know we're setting up our partners to be most successful when it comes to making good recommendations uh, and driving excellent service uh, to their brands. And for, for those who are listening that don't know what retention.com does, um, can you give just like a quick blurb on, on the offering there? Yeah, so um, the short of it is uh, we identify anonymous browsers on a website using opt-in third-party data to help brands and retailers connect with those really high intent customers. Um, so an example I really like to use, um, you know, you're shopping online, you're looking at something, you put it in cart, but if you didn't sign in to that website, um, you know, you really have no way for the brand to actually reach back out to you. So, I mean, I don't know about you, Brenda, do you do a lot of like kind of window shopping by putting things in cart that you like and then you just kind of leave? Yes, um, it's all I do. I don't actually ever buy anything. <laughs> but if you get those emails that say, hey, Brandon, 20% off that thing you put in your cart, um, you know, that's a really great way to capture some of those high intent customers. You know, they spend time on your site. Um, they really got interested in what your products were enough to, you know, put it aside and say like maybe for later, put it as a gift for themselves. Um, but what we're able to do is, you know, capture those shoppers both cross device. So, you know, if I'm actually shopping on my phone and I want to complete my transaction on my computer, we no longer have a lot of that tracking and data that allows that to happen. Um, or, you know, those customers that have just visited and not really given any information, not did that 10% off to give your email address and subscribe to the promo list. Um, yeah. So what we're really able to do is find those customers and help our um, our merchants to, you know, attract them, put them into their email flows and ultimately to convert on those orders. Yeah, I think um, there are a lot of really interesting sort of new solutions that we're starting to roll out with our with our clients this year. And I think retention.com is definitely at the, the top of that because we've used it sort of at certain points over the past couple of years. But now, I like, guess you all have continued to grow and now you're coming on as well. Um, oh. And it's a little bit more formalized. It'll be exciting to, to be able to grow together and work on that. Yeah, I'm excited. There's been a lot of growth on the retention.com team. Uh, so back last year, uh, we were all of six people, which is why a lot of folks haven't heard of us yet. Um, and my coming on last week pushes us past 40. Uh, so we're uh, we're in a big growth phase right now. And it's really exciting to see um, everyone getting to see how cool this product is, quite frankly, and uh, yeah. getting on board. What, I guess, what are some of the biggest differences that you've noticed from working at a company that was significantly larger um, and now coming in at sort of the earlier stages of a, of a growing startup? Um, I guess, what are the things that excite you about that? And then what, I know it's only been like two weeks, but what are the <laughs> things that you've noticed are, are different in a good way 
and I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of things that you can take from the bigger company like structure to help the small company grow, but I'm sure there's some things that you maybe don't want to bring over from the big company structure and processes as well. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, even past the last company I was at, I've worked um, across the board. So I've actually been at a 60,000 person company. Um, I've been as small as 15 people. So coming in around 40 is actually a really awesome space. Um, mm -hmm. I've been at a company this size, this exact size before as well. But I think the biggest difference that I'm seeing here um, from any company I've worked at is it's kind of a twofold piece. Um, the processes aren't there yet because we're growing. And as you grow, you need to build process. Um, yeah. But everyone is aware that it needs to be. And we're all working on building it together, um, which is a really, really cool space to be in to say, OK, we don't have any of this yet but we know that we do, <laughs> which means that you get a lot of people that have been seeing how things are growing, how they're scaling. Um, and there's a really collaborative um, working mentality that comes with that of saying, okay, we don't know, we don't have it yet. We don't know the best way to do it, but let's try something and let's see if this works or not. Let's test it. And then if it doesn't work, let's move on. Um, mm -hmm. and then the next version of this. And I think having that mentality, not getting caught in that sunk cost bias, um, it's really critical for any company at this stage, right? Like you're going to test something and it's not going to work. Um, and if you keep pushing to try and make that work, it's it's just going to go sideways. So it's really cool to see this, um, this test and learn mentality, as well as kind of this patience across the board of everyone knowing like, okay, this is how we're doing it right now. It's not the best way we're working on it, but this is what we've got for the time being. Yeah. So it's a really, it's a really fun space to be in. Yeah. I think that there's like a fine line between um, knowing when to pull back and potentially pivot versus it might just need a little bit more time, attention and effort, but this could be the right way to do it. Mm -hmm. And like understanding and trying to not have that sunk cost bias is, is very important. And while also not reinventing the wheel every 30 seconds either. Oh gosh, yeah. It's it's making sure things have enough time to like live and breathe and test and then having faith like, okay, like it, it might take a minute to see the results, but we'll get there. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure every company that's onboarded a CRM has felt this way <laughs> on how much easier it is to do in a Google sheet, but you can't scale a Google sheet and the way that we're growing, um, you know, we really need to have some of those operational efficiencies, um, you know, customers. Yeah. So making sure that everything we're doing is prioritizing the best experience for our customers and, you know, dealing with all the road bumps along the way. So, yeah, it's a really great time. How, how do you look at um, agencies as a sort of, I would say, function of your sales team? Um, and what sort of like things are you doing to try and enable and activate them more? Because uh, like when we've talked to partners like Clavio and, and so on, there's so much business that is referred and generated through that channel. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also a lot of overlap where like the internal sales team is working with the agency on bringing some deals across the line. And I know there's been pain points for some of our partners in years past with that because sales is all compensation oriented. Um, and so I guess it's sort of like four questions in one, but um, <laughs> What are you doing on on that front? And like, do you view partnerships as a whole, and more specifically, agencies as like a great way to get more adoption uh, across e-commerce businesses? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I like the the broad way of saying, "What are you doing?" <laughs> <laughs> um, no, absolutely. Uh, I think this is. I think I'm safe to say this. Um, we are designing this company to be a part partner led organization. Um, mm -hmm. I think because of the mentality that all of us have about how key it is to have strong partners. Um, you know, partnerships is a network of advocates. It's a network of trusted people um, and trusted advisors and experts, honestly, that are taking the time and energy to understand a product. Um, to understand the competitors of those products. And they also understand their customers um, just as good as the customer itself in some cases, especially when they're really managing huge swaths of their business. 
So, you know, our, our agency partners are doing so much in terms of educating their entire teams on who we are, what we do, how it works, who it works for, and who it doesn't work for. And I think that's really, really important when you're making good recommendations uh, to understand who's going to get the most value out of any tool or product. Um, mm -hmm. So we're really prioritizing, making sure that our partners have everything they need. Um, and then, and that doesn't just happen up into the sales cycle and then hand it off. We actually have... Um, we have someone from our CS team that only works on any deals that are sourced by our partners. So we make sure that that entire process from end to end is entirely smooth for all of our partners, for their customers, um, that everyone is really on the same page. Because, you know, if you if you have this amazing partner program and then it goes <laughs> into this black hole, then I'm not doing yeah. that. And I need to make sure that my entire team is aligned on that. So um, we really have, you know, in part, part of this is onboarding our our agency partners, we have a lot of inbound interest, um, which is a really, really exciting place to be in. So making sure that everyone that wants to work with us has an opportunity to that, you know, anyone that wants to make sure that their customers know that latest and greatest in technology that we're able to provide them with the education and resources for that. Um, but also, I really want to build out an amazing partner program that hits at the core of what our partners need, that education, but also showcasing our mutual success so that mm -hmm. you know, they have those things to point to when they tell a customer, you really need to put this in place. It's going to grow your business. Here's how we've done it with, you know, half of our portfolio at this point in time. Um, and also, you know, giving them the recognition they deserve. Like, I, I know you do a lot of work. You do way, way more work than I would have ever wanted <laughs> in terms of building and growing. And it's incredible, but you know, you need to be recognized that you're putting in the work that you're someone to be trusted with growing and building mm -hmm. a brand. Um, and you know, that's in part where that partner network, I get to really make sure that everyone sees all the great work that my partners are doing. Yeah. So you're like coming in sort of at the ground level here in terms of building out the framework of the agency partner program. So what are the top three things that you're prioritizing, I would say, uh, in terms of what you're doing first? Because I look at all of our other tech partner programs and there's everything from your standard, here's the way that you refer businesses in and earn to here's all these agency accreditations that you can go and take. So there's all these different badges and certifications. Then there's some programs that have tiers so that you're like silver, gold, platinum, elite, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, there's like a lot of things that can go into an agency partner program, but they're obviously doing all of those immediately would be overkill for you um, and also probably just not <laughs> realistic. So I guess what are the things that you're prioritizing first and foremost mm -hmm. um, that are going to, to drive the most ROI uh, for, for your program? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the most important thing across the board is education, right? Like, you know, it's 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 one thing to be like, you should work with retention.com, but if their customer says why and they're sitting there like, because they're our partner, that's that's <laughs> not gonna do the job. Um, so really making sure that everyone that touches the product is educated in it. Um, and you know, these are busy people, like. I'm not a developer, but I can tell you that I've never met a developer. It's like, yeah, I have a ton of free time. Like, you know, that's that's definitely not the space that I've ever seen. I've worked in an agency before and I can tell you I did not have any free time to go, you know, sit in a room for an hour and listen to someone tell me about how their version of this tech is the latest and greatest and we'll do everything for it. Um, so in part, it's making sure that the right education gets to the right people in the format that they need. Right. Like, do you need an hour to sit with me and ask all the questions about like how to refer a lead if you're the person putting a snippet of code on a page and setting up a workflow? Like, no. Um, so in part, I really want to make sure that education is that first step um, and creating education in a way that's, you know, formatted for everyone that needs to know it. Every different person within an org that needs to understand who we are and what we do, um, making sure that each of them have access to that version of that. So, you know, that can mm -hmm. come in the form of short term, short form content that can come in, you know, actual in-person meetings, but that can also come in like a variety of different ways. Um, and like you said, you know, making sure that recognition's out there, um, having a program that really highlights, okay, like, you know, if this, if this badge certification actually means something that like, that means that this company can put us in place immediately, that like, there's no problems, if that's going to drive value for partners, um, and that's kind of in part where that next part comes is 
you can't build a partner program without asking your partners what they want and need and what's going to drive the most value for them. So, you know, once they know who we are and what we do, um, and then once we learn from them what's what the things are that they need the most, then that's really my next step. Um, you know, tell me what you need and I'll make sure I get it done. Yeah, I think, I mean, for us, one of the most important things in the sales process and just in everything that we do, even though it's sort of trivial, it's just the the badge, um, like yeah. the, and it doesn't even necessarily have to be uh, like tiered. And for some of our newer apps that we work with, we just have them like spin up a logo. It's not even like official, and yeah. it'll be like, oh, uh, X app certified partner or whatever. Um, but then like, the eventually that gets to a point where it actually means something. Like our Clavio Elite badge is instant credibility and recognition for the prospect that we're talking to and so as opposed to us saying that we're really strong in email and sms marketing we have that validation from a third party which goes a lot further than just us saying it ourselves same goes for like co-marketing like case studies we don't really show our own case studies anymore we just use the ones that partners have created for us about work that we've done and it makes it a lot more authoritative um, than it would be otherwise Absolutely. And back when I was at Signified, I um, I had the privilege of building out our partner certification program and, you know, building those badges and those education courses and sessions. Mm-hmm. So you know, that was something really exciting to be able to lend that legitimacy to our partners and to really showcase like, hey, you've put in the work, um, you've done this before. And, you know, this is this is something that we can now point to as well when we're talking to our customers that are asking for who are the best in the space and the experts. And that's kind of that other step that, you know, making sure that we're getting our partners in front of our customers. Um, if we're trusting you to do our builds constantly, then, you know, we want to make sure that our customers know that too, um, that they right. understand these are the best players in the business. This is who's going to build their site the best, who's going to do their marketing the best, who's going to do their creative the best. Um, so that's always another you know, leg of that partner program. And I think one that kind of gets neglected a bit of, um, of making sure that, you know, if we're doing all this work and we're bringing all these customers in that, you know, they get to see who are the people that are standing up all these incredible sites. Yeah, I think so many times I've seen like, because there's a lot of software out there and apps, obviously. And so it's just like, (laughs) so you're you're in a great place that you have all this inbound interest because I get so many outbound emails being like, do you want to join our partner program? Do you want to join our affiliate program? Whatever it may be. And they always lead with like, oh, we're offering 30% commission on this and that. And I'm like, okay, like, great. Don't really care because if your solution isn't something that actually makes sense for us, works, et cetera, et cetera, mm-hmm. none of this stuff moves the needle for us. Like, we're not going to recommend software because, oh, there happens to be some sort of a uh, higher payout associated with it. Like maybe if there were two really large players and they were basically the same thing and was hyper competitive, that would do something. But I think too often agency partner programs are started thinking about the financial incentives versus how can we help one another grow together. And Mm -hmm. like that education, um, all those partner resources are super helpful for us because then they are baked into our new team member onboarding and also given out to the team as like continuing education. So we're able to train our team up based off of the investment that you've made in the resources. And then that way, every new like email and SMS team member has to go through like the five retention.com certifications. So just naturally there'll be more, I would say, likely to not only use and adopt your solution, but start referring it to their clients who aren't. And I think it gets more and more important as the agency gets larger and larger because I'm not doing the tech stack recommendations for all of our clients anymore. Like a, a lot of that gets handed off to the actual team delivering and executing for them. So I guess that's my two cent rant on a. Jeez, five certifications. You're giving me a lot of homework. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we start with one here, but in the case, in the cases of that. large platforms like Clavio, for example, that makes sense to have multiple certifications because there's different types of products and users, but um I think one is a good place to start here. <laughs> we'll start there. I'll make sure you get a badge as soon as possible. <laughs> Perfect. I, I Can I get the special, didn't actually have to take it, but here's the badge. I you always get uh, the only retention.com badge that exists as of this podcast. And you can put it on your LinkedIn and I might get in trouble, but it's fine. <laughs> um, 
So are there any partner programs that you look at for inspiration or as yeah. a model? Yeah, I mean, you've mentioned Klaviyo a couple of times and, you know, almost all of our customers use Klaviyo. So that's one that's always top of mind. Um, I think Recharge also has an excellent partner program. Um, I'm happy to also mention that our uh, our marketing manager is formerly at Recharge. So we've brought some of that incredible talent over to retention.com. Um, and I would be remiss for not calling out uh, my friends at Yapo, uh, who we've also mm -hmm. got some incredible talent uh, from Yapo on the partnerships team. Um, so yeah, we've really brought some really heavy hitters in terms of um, you know partner programs that I think have really set an incredible stage. Um, you know, I, I'm going to say that I love the Signified Partner Program. It was really incredible to build. So it's really exciting to have an opportunity uh, to continue building um, and also to lean on some of the incredible marketing programs that Signified's run, the 30 most influential in e-commerce, um, you know, Yapo's amazing women in e-commerce. We've really seen some really amazing programs coming out of these tech partners. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's cool to be able to have effectively a blank slate with some really awesome people um, to build what we hope will be a best in class partner program. Yeah, no, that that makes a lot of sense. I think uh, Recharge is a good call out because they've been investing a lot in their educational content, um, which is nice. But one thing I've actually been thinking about is, um, and I've been pushing on some of our partners for this, like, because we'll, for our partners that don't have these things, like. I'll create the YouTube videos that our team then uses for their own like internal training and stuff. And mm -hmm. uh, it'd be cool to highlight partners in like have them do the videos essentially. Like yeah. versus having a whole team dedicated to like technical writing, technical video how to's and stuff like that. Just like pick your top five agency partners who are early adopters of the product, have them do the videos and then plug them into the platform. And it's like resources that are going to be looked at by merchants. And so then that could be a potential like lead funnel for them. Oh, um, I love that. That's such a good idea. So you want to do a, uh, a retention.com lunch and learn, Brandon? <laughs> I, I kind of do. Um, yes. I think oh, it'd be great. Cool. Yeah. Webinars, lunch and learns. Um, I'm not paying for the Uber Eats, but I'll show up and I'll do the lunch and learn. <laughs> there we go. And, you know, one of those things that we're really doing strongly here, um, I'd be remiss to not call out my uh, my CEO, Adam, uh, is really making that YouTube journey of what retention.com is doing as a company. Um, it's not mm -hmm. often that you see a company growing this way. So uh, we're cataloging that journey. Um, it's called Work in Public. You can find us uh, on YouTube at retention.com and you can follow the uh, the internal journey of uh, becoming a unicorn. So it's uh, it's really cool to actually have that um, what we're doing internally uh, be showcased out to the world. No, oh, that's awesome. I'm definitely going to look that up. I think uh, YouTube as a platform is really powerful in general. And, and it's cool to be able to get that behind the scenes. And that's what people are looking for now more than anything is that authenticity. Um, and so just being real and transparent with what you're doing is Maybe we'll sort of make the it best way to go about it. <laughs> We'll start converting our videos into uh, I, I, the app after this. <laughs> I have one because to post the video content and then slowly but surely I've started to like waste some of my day and time scrolling through that damn thing. So I would uh, highly recommend being very careful. <laughs> oh See, that's why I've stayed off of it. I have no self-control. <laughs> yeah, but that's me too. So <laughs> I'm like, oh, let me post about uh, some sort of e-commerce tip or trick. And like, oh, there's a cute dog. That's like, I don't know, or a bunch of cute puppies in some sort of little video that I am going to watch now in an endless scroll for the next 20 minutes. But how does Bella feel about you looking at other dogs? I, we've not had that conversation yet. I think, um, I think she, I think she can hear you though. Cause she just ran in here. Um, but <laughs> you're going to get in trouble. <laughs> She's she's the uh she's the unofficial team mascot. I think uh, we're able to showcase some of our own like sort of fun Gen Z vibe and energy by littering our website with pictures of dogs and animals. So I think every website should have at least three dogs on it. I agree. It should be a rule. Make it a part of like the ADA compliance things that all of these brands have been getting lawsuits for over the past couple of years. 
Um, we can add a tab on our website. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. Um, well, I guess one other thing I wanted to ask you, since you've been at a variety of different sizes of uh, companies at various stages of growth, like what are some of the call outs or things that you would suggest to others who are trying to grow and scale a team uh, in sort of terms of like tips or tricks that you would say that they should be focused on? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think we did touch on earlier of, you know, making sure that you have a plan going into something, but you're willing to move away from it. Um, yeah. You should not ever throw spaghetti at the wall and hope it works. I hope we're past that at this point in time. Um, but, you know, if things aren't working the way you thought they would, um, be flexible. And, you know, I can say I made that mistake at a at a company before where I was pushing on something that I thought would be the best way to do things and it wasn't getting the adoption. And uh, and yeah, I, I spun my wheels for months to no avail and I'm happy that I've learned that experience before, <laughs> but yeah, be willing to be flexible, take feedback. Um, nothing's your baby. So just, you know, kind of roll with it and make sure that what you're creating is best for the people that are actually using it. Um, mm -hmm. And then the other one, and I can't under stress this one, but invest in diversity and talent upfront. Like you cannot do it retroactively. You cannot retroactively make your company diverse across every level. You have to start day one. Um, and I think it's really important to like use networks of talent, like people that you know, people that have been within your network or your colleagues' networks to to effectively vet, you know, the the value of the people that are coming in and talent. I think that's really, really important way to, you know, make sure that you're getting um mm -hmm. getting some of the best in class people within a company. But at the same time, if that if that referral pool is very homogenous, you're going to have all the same ideas in a room. Uh, and that's the easiest way to kill a company because you won't be seeing something that someone else is seeing and growing and making an opportunity out of. Um, so yeah, right. I mean, there's, there's a lot of talented people in e-commerce and in tech. There's a lot of layoffs right now as well. So you know, reach out to your network and your network's network, see who, who's doing incredible things and make sure that you're keeping at top of mind of having a lot of different people in the room of different backgrounds. Um, it's, it's, you just can't build it backwards. Yeah. Our first like 20 to 25 hires were all referral based, um, mm -hmm. but came out of like, I would say the first two or three were just random. Like I had to go out and sort of find them. Yeah. And so they were all a little different and unique in their own ways. And so then they had their own networks and then their networks had networks. And so we ended up with a very diverse group of um, individuals, though all like kind of within the same age range, um, which wasn't necessarily intentional, but it was just sort of a byproduct of mm -hmm. everything that we were doing. And we just sort of happened our way into having a really unique team. I don't think it was necessarily something that we did intentionally, but I think if you go about hiring the right way, then it just happens versus yeah. if you, like, I wouldn't say we went out of our way to make it diverse. It mm -hmm. just happened that way because we were looking for different sort of characteristics and attributes in every role. And um, that just lent itself to building a more diverse company, which I mean, is really great because if there were just 50 Brandons running around at this organization, we'd probably have no clients and we <laughs> would, it just would not work because different personalities do things dif differently. And um, I'm not going to sit there and design you a really cool looking website, nor do I want to, but um, I'm also not going to be the one who's super, super happy on every client call and like <laughs> present things the grip the best way. So everybody, knows the role, does it very well. And I think it just gives credence to what you're saying even more so. Yeah, yeah, I think it's it's great. I'm really happy that you've had that experience with your team. Um, and then also one of my little pro tips, if you are hiring off of resumes, um, I always chop the name off, the name, the address, the background. I just, I literally cut the top off of them and read them from there because it, there's so mm -hmm. many little, little unconscious biases that exist that, you know, when you really just look at the uh, the meat and bones of it, you can find some really incredible talent. Um, yeah, we're we're actually um, 
for I'd say the last year of electric before we got acquired. Um, and then since with an outsourced team, my uh, brother and I have been building a, a product that has a lot of different components to it um, in the HR space, but it's sort of a dual sided job board and ATS system. And one of the biggest components of that is the ability to anonymize the entire process up until the final round. Because when I was trying to hire for um, electric, first of all, it's just like a complete crapshoot. Like you'd post a job on LinkedIn, you get like 450 applicants, maybe yeah. five of them had actually logged into Shopify before. And then you just pay to LinkedIn like five grand to promote the post. It's like, I don't even know why I'm doing this. <laughs> um, and then on his end, he's trying to look for internships and he's getting recommendations to go be the chief marketing officer at Disney and just stuff that makes no sense for somebody that's in college. So like clearly the algorithms are broken there. But beyond that, I was thinking like just everyone wants to say that they don't have bias or whatever, but I think that's a load of BS. Like when I, when I'm, when I was hiring, I wasn't being like, oh, I'm directly looking for like X, Y, and Z necessarily, but just growing up your own circumstances, environment, whatever, you're going to have bias, no matter what. I don't care how many times you can say that you don't have bias. And so uh, for me, I thought that's why uh, being able to anonymize it would be really, really valuable because you're not seeing things like name, location, uh, demographic data, things like that, which I would say I didn't take into account when hiring, but inherently there was some bias probably when I went through that. So I'm really excited for that to come out um, and actually probably the next month or two here and see what sort of adoption we can get within the community I'm as really this becomes more of a prevalent, uh, I wouldn't say issue, like it's actually, because I think for so long, <clears throat> like DEI and diversity has been looked at as like, oh, this is an issue that our company has to address, but not necessarily like, oh, if we do this, it's going to benefit us. Whereas what we're talking about here is that having a diverse and like um, very differing opinions and views within your team actually is valuable for the company. I and so. I think that mindset shift is really important. Um, like we're actually doing this because we're going, it's going to make us better. We're, it's going to make us more money. I think too often like companies conflate uh, social responsibility with like profit loss or with not maximizing value. Whereas in this case, it could not be further from the truth. Yeah. So I'm excited to see what your product does. I think that's <laughs> exactly what we need in the market because wow, it's getting crazy. Um, and my last tip, uh, don't make useless meetings. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh, I'm so with Shopify on this one. Like, put me down in in like mm -hmm. stone. But yeah, so like building things is fast, and people are moving quickly. And if you know, you could have your entire day be filled with internal meetings where no one actually gets anything done. So like, I will advocate for Slack huddles as well. When you need to chat yes. with someone, just ring them. Just there we go. We're there. It's like being, it's like going over to someone's desk. Remember those days? I don't know if your, if your audio listeners are, I uh, had to ever work at a desk job. Oh my God. But yeah, just go and talk to someone. Now Slack lets us do that if you're not in an office together, but yeah. oh God, do not create useless meetings. <laughs> yeah. I mean, some things are, are easier for sure just to hop on and chat through, but like the amount of meetings I've gone to where there's no agenda and you're just waiting and then oh somebody's like five minutes late so then everybody's just sitting there staring at each other so that person gets on it's just so much wasted time and and if i could count how many times i've been on a meeting where i've said nothing it would be it, it's it's a significant number which should not be the case if you're on a meeting and you say nothing you probably should not be there love that send me an email after you <laughs> see yourself in the chat don't spend five minutes going around the whole zoom call like we got this guys we know how to do this <laughs> exactly plus like when you have 14 monitors and there's all these different notifications hey, that are what happening are you doing brandon no, I, it might be an over exaggeration but um, i feel like it's not i feel like i just called <laughs> <it> out <laughs> that's why i have the uh, that wall the of fake monitors, background like in silicon valley <laughs> <laughs> exactly for my 14 different jobs that i'm currently doing at once um well hey thank you so much for uh joining us but before we 
hop off, can you just let everybody know like where they can find you uh, and also retention online? Yes, of course. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn with the other millennials, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, Megan Blissick on LinkedIn. Um, if you want to partner with us or know more about retention.com, always happy to chat. Um, and then, like I mentioned earlier on YouTube at retention.com, spell out the dot. Uh, you can see a couple things going on with um, with our team. You can see that uh, that work in public or journey to becoming a unicorn, as well as uh, 10 years in the making, which is a podcast for e-commerce founders. Uh, so yeah, check us out. Awesome. You guys have a lot of content that you're already putting A lot out. of content. I know it's really cool. It's really fun and like kind of goofy. So I think you'll enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Well, uh, as always, this is Brandon Amoroso. You can find me at brandonamoroso.com uh, or electricmarketing.com. Thank you everybody for listening and uh, we'll see you next time.